Hello everyone, my name is Sophie Neary and I am Group Director of Facebook for the UK and Ireland. Welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Series and I'm delighted to hand you over to our host, Jonathan bowman Perks. Thank you very much indeed, Sophie. It was lovely, lovely having you on this series and we've had some good chats both before this and on another occasion because it was Paul Cooper who was a very inspiring speaker who he recommended you. And I think you've got so much to bring. And, and if anybody goes to your, uh, your LinkedIn page, I mean, an awesome collection, as we're going to talk about later, of experiences and things you've done, and also just the light and the dark of our lives and what you learn from it. And I'm really looking forward to our top tips. So let's go in and talk about your current role, the kind of things you're doing at the moment. Uh, and then we can go back to right in the early part of your life as you grew up, who influenced you and some of the values you held back then. And, and bring us forward to today. So Sophie, over to you about cover rule. Thanks, so I have been at Facebook for just over 12 months now. And um, as is becoming more and more common during these very, very different times that we live in, I've actually never been into the Facebook office. I was uh, recruited before the pandemic started. And uh, prior to that, I was on the board of Boots in the UK where I ran boots.com and also digital retail transformation. Um, so by the time I actually arrived at Facebook, the whole world had turned upside down and um, I still, uh, 13 months in, have never actually met my team face to face. Um, I've had one meeting face to face with my boss, apart from an interview, and um, my responsibility is uh, to take care and look after some of our biggest uh, corporate clients who choose Facebook to promote um, and elevate their businesses to engage, attract, and acquire new customers um, throughout the UK um, and leveraging all of the Facebook family of apps. So that's Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, and our, our new amazing virtual reality capabilities of which are focused around Oculus. Fantastic. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great brand to work for and, and it's making a huge difference in the world. Now we're in the digital era. It's, the, it's both the pandemic and the digital era. So I think that's a really fascinating one. Thank you for that, Sophie. So, so take us right back to when you were born, where you were born, the kind of things that influenced you, events that happened through your life that makes you the leader that you are today that we see in, in Facebook as group director of UK and Ireland. Oh, God, that's a great question. So um, I don't sound like it, but I am actually from Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. Huddersfield? I'm from Halifax. Oh, there great. You go. <laughs> there you go. So um, and I think what's really interesting, uh, and I know that we'll come on to talk a lot about diversity and inclusion and representation because it's a real passion point of mine. But uh, the real reason that I, that I don't have um, a really strong Yorkshire accent is because I'm 50 years old. And when I was growing up on the BBC and on the television, everybody spoke the Queen's English. And there was a bias against people who had very, very strong regional accents. And my dad had a very strong, um, or has a very strong Yorkshire accent. And when he used to go to London on business, he would get mercilessly teased and ribbed. And um, he only ever wanted the best for his daughters. And he was absolutely determined that he thought it was hard enough in life to be born a woman, um, but a woman with a Yorkshire accent, um, he felt that that was one handicap too far. And, uh, and so one of the things that we were never allowed to do at home was to say bath or we had to say bath um, and grass, not grass. And um, he, my mum originally was, was from Surrey. So she actually migrated to Yorkshire and, and met my dad there. She was a dentist as part of her job. Um, but I think that's a really interesting thing because now, you know, I, you meet people from all over the world and their accents quite rightly are celebrated about making who they are. Um, and I think it's a, a shame in a way that, that I couldn't have stayed as true to my roots as I'd like to be. But I was, I was definitely brought up with the values that I still have today around um, integrity, kindness, um, hard work. You get in what you put, uh, you get out what you put in. Um, and I was you know, very fortunate to have been brought up in a very loving family. My parents are still married. I had a, I had a pretty exceptional upbringing. And one of the things I'm sure we'll come on to talk about is how talent is equally distributed and opportunity is not. And I was very fortunate that I have worked very, very hard throughout my entire career. I'm also very conscious 
that I was very fortunate to have uh, a great education and to have been afforded opportunities that I could then make the most of. And I had to work hard to make the most of. Uh, and I'm very cognizant that there are still far too many people in the UK, let alone across the world, who, who don't even have that opportunity to do the hard work to make the difference. I think that's a really profound uh, statement. And perhaps now, now you and I, and I was the same. My mother uh, would do things as she brought me up in Halifax. And they always said, come hell or hell or Halifax, the good Lord deliver us. Because we had a gibbet and so did Hull and you got hung only probably about 60 years ago was it stopped for thieving or whatever it might be. And, uh, and, and when I worked on a farm, they used to say, now then, lad, there's now to strangers folk. Everyone here is queer except thee and me. And even these are a bit odd sometimes. And, um, and so I was always with my friends, but like you, my mother would always insist that we, we spoke that way. Father was uh, a, a, a naval officer who was killed when I was only two and a half, but mother determined to bring us up in, in that way. So I've always sounded, uh, and my wife's family always teased me that I'm the posh one, but I'm not, but I just, the voice. So it, it's quite funny, but I don't know about you. Do you find when you go back to Yorkshire or particularly Huddersfield, that the act, there's, it just slips a bit in. I know my wife, who's from Ireland, when she goes back to Ireland, she talks about toothbrush and things like this. Uh, do you find it slips back into the Audisfield accent? Well, ap apparently there's still some words that I say that still have a twang. So I say lime, whereas if I was really posh, I'd say lime. <laughs> and I say computer rather than computer. <laughs> yeah, but bath and path, we, we definitely, definitely had that one. Um, and... Let's go on to proudest moments and darkest moments in your life, Sophie, um, because you've had some dark moments, and particularly one tragic one recently, um, for which my thoughts are with you. So let's go for darkest moments first and what you learned from them, perhaps a couple of those, one personal and one work, and then uh, proudest moments and also what you learned from those. Yeah, thank you. Um, gosh, so... I'll start with my career darkest moment because that's a slightly easier one to talk about. Um, and I think it's really, really important that as leaders we talk about these issues because, you know, back in the day when I was young, you never talked about your failures. That was seen as something that was bad or, you know, career limiting even. And I'm, I'm really pleased that now modern leadership is much more about understanding that, you know, everyone has their ups and downs. Um, everyone has their trials and tribulations and actually it's what we learn from them and how we move forwards is that it is that that, that is what really matters um uh you know it's not who we are that counts it's what we do that matters type of thing mm -hmm. so about oh i got probably get the timing wrong six six seven years ago now i used to work for jack wills um i've worked for lots of amazing companies in my time i've never worked um for an apparel company before i'd, I'd always wanted to do it it was a job i really loved uh, Jack Wills, for those of you who, who don't know, is a, a young brand, apparel brand that was in the UK, the US um, and in Asia. And it was very similar to Abercrombie and Fitch. It was like a British version of Abercrombie and Fitch for those who know Abercrombie and Fitch. And it was it was so much fun. I was their chief marketing officer um, and I, I loved that job and I and I really loved my team. It was the first time I probably managed a very young team in terms of the age difference between us. Um, and uh, we were going through a process where the ownership structure of the company was changing and a private equity firm were coming in to take a majority share. And throughout the process, um, I was always told, we love you, Sophie, you're, you're a keeper. We don't want you to think about leaving. Um, you know, you're, you're part of the future of Jack Wills. And, you know, essentially I had a huge, huge role in the organization. And uh, I think on the Friday, the deal closed and on the Monday morning, I, I went into the office and I met my boss and I was told I was being made redundant. So I, I really didn't see it coming. And when we talk about values um, and integrity that I think one of the reasons I was so upset about it was because I, it really, really jarred with, with my kind of core backbone um, around integrity. And uh, you know, I was, I was heartbroken. I, I, I talked about it at the time. It was a bit like being dumped by a boyfriend who you knew was then still going to see all of your great friends all the time and you weren't. Because I, 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 you know, I'm still in touch with a lot of my team. In fact, one of them I brought to Boots. I still mentor quite a few of them. And, and I, you know, I, was, I was hurt, like really physically hurt mm. um, in a way that I hadn't ever been in my career before. 
and I and I thought well gosh you know that's I'm 44 years old that's it my you know my career you know what am I going to do next and um, I spoke to some headhunters and they were like no you've got a great background Sophie you've worked in digital since the mid 90s and I was like yes actually you know I'm going to I'm going to be okay and I, I am good at what I do and I had a I did have a track record that that demonstrated that um, but I realized actually I was really tired and I'd worked non-stop since I was 22 years old and when you've done internet startups and sold them to companies like Sun Microsystems and Googles and um, you know, working in digital is 24 seven. You don't stop work in digital at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and then pick it up again on a Monday morning at, at nine o'clock. I think I can't remember, um, you know, the last time uh, I hadn't actually worked over Christmas or a Christmas day because sale now goes live on Christmas Eve. And I was like, no, I need, I need a break. And I decided I was gonna have a gap year. And uh, the headhunters at the time were all saying, that is a terrible idea. You know, you've fallen off the horse, get back on the horse, get back in the game, get another job. And I was listening to all of that, but inside, in my, not even in my tummy, in my heart, I just knew my heart wasn't in it. Uh, you know, I'd sort of fallen out of love with business, fallen out of love, of, and I, I totally understand it's a business decision, it's not personal, but everybody who's been through it knows that it feels personal everybody I, and anyone who says it doesn't it doesn't feel personal I think mm. you know I'd respectfully say to them they're not being true to themselves and I, I just knew I needed that break I'd always wanted to do a ski season I'd never done one because I went straight to work after university I'd learned to kite surf I was really rubbish at it but I wanted to champion it when I was eight years old in junior school I did a project on the Annapurna mountains in Nepal I'd always always wanted to go to Nepal and so I thought right sod it that's what I'm going to do. So I am in my 1969 Series 2 Land Rover with my little Jack Russell Terrier, Tiggy. Um, I, via Airbnb, rented an apartment in Tarifa in southern Spain, which is not only one of the windiest towns in the world, but also, um, you know, the closest point, the most southernmost tip of continental Europe looks out over Africa. And I spent um, six months there kite surfing, um, walking my dog on the beach. Uh, fortunately, I speak Spanish, so I had a bit of a, a, a leg up there. Uh, and that was amazing. And then I achieved my lifelong ambition. I went to Nepal for three and a half months. I trekked the Annapurna circuit, which is like a 21 day circuit. And then I also did a high route, uh, five peaks pass uh, through Everest base camp. Cause I thought you can't go to Nepal and not see Everest. I mean, we could do a whole hour podcast on that trip. I mean, talk about putting, pushing yourself to the limit. On that, the Everest trip, I was the oldest by 15 years and 11 of us started and only three people finished. And there were literally sections I was on my hands and knees screaming at myself to, to keep going. Uh, not actually realizing I was screaming out loud at one point. I thought I was just sort of talking to myself in my head. Wow. Um, and then I did a ski season in Chamonix in France. Uh, which was also um, amazing. And, and I had the best year of my life. And I came back cleverer. I came back smarter. I came back clearer on my goals and my objectives. And I came back with this amazing clarity in what I wanted to do and where I would make a compromise when it came to live work integration, let's call it, because I don't think it's a balance anymore. Um, and, and where I would, would not compromise and you know isn't it isn't it hilarious whether that's ironic or, or or fate i ended up with the best job of my career just straight off the back of a gap year having had those headhunters tell me well your career will go backwards sophie and i i got a job running the largest health and beauty well-being business in the uk if not one of the ones in the world boots is part of a dow jones company the walgreens boots alliance um and on the board of that retailer which Gosh, I didn't know the maths wise, probably 200 times bigger than Jack Wills, maybe even 500 times. Um, so it just goes to show that we all have failures, we all have setbacks, and it you can't pretend that they don't happen, but you, you can, you can turn them triumph over adversity. You've just got, you've got to look for the opportunities. Mm. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and 
I know when you talk to the charity and the young girls who, who need to be motivated, who've got very difficult backgrounds in the Inspired Leadership Trust, uh, and been through abuse and modern day trade, slavery and trafficking and things like that, that to see the story that you talk about and your example of crawling on your hands and knees and shouting out to keep going and things like that, it's very interesting. And also, before we come on to your next rather tragic personal story, which uh, is, is very poignant, I'm just taken by the fact that you did take, I encourage people to take sabbaticals. I really encourage the, the leaders I work with and coach, and they all benefit from it. Even just the walk this morning with my dog, Archie, the, the Cocker Spaniel, while I was walking over the hill, I had more thoughts about my next book and the podcast series. And it's when you're walking and you're just out in nature or kite surfing or I, I um, with the Gurkhas, I went to Nepal myself, so I love Nepal. But you have that time and space to recover and then discover. And it's only yeah. through walking or having time out. So everybody must do it. Everyone has had the time off. I mean, must take holidays. I'm taking one next Friday. I'm going away to Madeira with my wife for 10 nights. And we're just going to switch off and relax because we need it. Um, your, your second personal darkest moment and, and what you've learned from that. And that's very recent for you. And I'm sorry about that. Thank you. I would say I'm, you know, still still learning about it. So um, uh, very tragically, six weeks ago today, actually, my sister passed away from COVID. Um, and uh, actually, she is the first person I know that was even hosp hospitalized from COVID, um, let alone um, succumbed to this indiscriminate um, virus that, that we're all having to live with and, and through. And... Um, there, there. Obviously, uh, you know, grief is is a terrible thing. But I, it's it's uh, all this time. I was very worried about protecting my parents. My dad's eighty. My mum's seventy eight. And my sister and I talked a lot about how we could wrap them up in cotton wool and protect them from the virus and make sure that they were safe. Um, and it never occurred to me for a single moment that it might take her from me instead. And. I've heard a lot over the past six weeks how, and I don't have children and my sister didn't have children. I chose to be child free. Um, a lot how a parent should never have to bury a child. But I have now also learned how unbelievably hard it is to have to tell your parents that they have lost a daughter because I, I was on the phone um, to Dubai and and it was I, I was the person who found out and, and I had to go and and tell my parents that and you know no little sister should have to bury their big sister when when she's only 51 years old and um I, you know everyone has different journeys through grief and you know i i know you've also been through yours as, as well jonathan very recently and um you know my heart really goes out um to you on that as well but my sister had this great motto on her facebook page which um is live a uh, live a life you will remember and what has really come clear to me is that no matter how dark the skies are overhead, there, there are always rays of sunshine, but you have to choose to seek them out and to look for them. And we have had hundreds of letters from people all around the world who met my sister, some who obviously have known her for a very long time, some who met her very briefly, but who cared enough or whose lives she touched enough and made enough of a difference that when they heard what had happened, they, they sat down, you know, they didn't write an email, they sat down and, and they write, wrote a letter and, and got photos printed and, and sent them to my, to my parents and I. And, um, you know, I feel extraordinarily proud that she did live a life and um, that she has been incredibly remembered. And one of the loveliest things that I, that I found out is I had a message from someone who was in her team. So um, she worked for um, Emirates. Um, uh, she had actually just changed companies, but she worked for Emirates for a long time. And um, I had a message from a, a young Emirati lady who worked for my sister, who reached out to me to um, say that um, quite often, I quite often do posts on LinkedIn and particularly talking about being single and, and being child-free because it's a less usual path um, for, for women to take. And it's something that has a bit of a stigma that's surrounded with it. Um, and um, she said that um, when I had done my posts on LinkedIn, um, my sister would invite her into 
my sister's office and and show her my videos and and I had no idea that Carmen and my sister called Carmen that Carmen had, had ever done that and um uh, and I just suddenly real you know I, I realized how she'd been a champion and a cheerleader of mine when I had never even known it even though I you know she was my fiercest friend and my fiercest critic as all big sisters should be and which is why it's important to talk about it now because doing things like this are about living a life that you will remember and, and I would want her to be remembered for all of the amazing things that she did have and you know, we 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 do live in extraordinary times. I'm I'm incredibly conscious of the situation in Afghanistan at the moment. I worked in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Um, I worked there during during the time. You know, I lived in New York from 1998 till 2002. Um, and my sister died when she was 51. It's decades too soon. Just as your your brother passing, I'm sure is the same. Um, but back to this opportunity. Um, is not equal. Talent is equally distributed. Opportunity is not. My sister had amazing opportunities and she had a far better 51 years of life on this planet than many, many other people did. And, you know, for that, we, that is another ray of light that we have to be incredibly grateful for. Yeah. I mean, Sophie, I think I will remember your comments just now all my life. Uh, and I think of, of, of all the podcasts that I've had, this, this has touched me deeply. Um, and thank you for sharing that. And, and only the strong can be vulnerable is a, is a truth I have found. It, it is so interesting that when someone you love dies, you learn even more about them from people who remember them in certain ways. And it was so lovely that your the stories that you get in really touched you and, and you learned other things that you never knew about how special Carmen was. Uh, I think about uh, my father when he was killed. Uh, he was only 33, fast jet pilot. And I was two and a half, so I, I wouldn't know him, but it was later in life when I had a personal crisis and thought I was God's gift at Santos, but I wasn't. And I got an average report rather than outstanding. And I reached out to people who'd known my father to learn more about what good inspiring leaders do. And I got letters from all over the world telling me amazing stories about my father that my mother had never heard that my brothers hadn't heard uh, and that I hadn't heard. And then when my mother died 13 years ago yesterday, um, again, people said to us how much she'd done to help others less fortunate than herself in Halifax, just down the road from Huddersfield, and, and what she'd done for um, the, the Peace Hall in Halifax, she'd helped to restore it. And if it, oh, was in it if, if it was in Italy, people would travel all over the world to see it. In fact, in Halifax, they don't. And then when David died a few weeks ago, um, so suddenly, just 10 weeks after diagnosis, uh, and I'm sure it was quick as well for Carmen, um, I've had stories from people about how kind and thoughtful he was helping Graham when he was stabbed, but also other people who died and how thoughtful and things he'd done for them that had touched their lives that I never knew about. So thank you for sharing that because all the people listening all over the world in different countries must remember that it's in our lifetimes that we should share stories with each other, not to find out when we're dead. Yeah. And, and so have those conversations with sisters or brothers or parents. Don't leave it too late. Now you clearly have had those. And I was able to have conversations with David in the 10 weeks before he died, which I'm really glad I did. But it, it, it's always, uh, these things teach us so much. Now to take us from such a place and my condolences deeply with you on this, to a, a brighter uplit, sunlit uplands, as Churchill would talk about. Um, what about one of the happiest times in your life and what you learned from that? Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've got so many. I mean, what, it's, it's almost like an, an environment of riches. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to choose. Um, it's hard to choose the, I'm not sure I have a best one, um, but Again, you know, back to incredible opportunities that I think I, I have I've just been able to then, um, you know, seize the day and, and, and live for the moment. When I was when I was 28 years old, I was working for a small Internet startup company in the UK called JCP. You, you won't have heard of them, but very sophisticated um, security um, software that we developed. And I was sent to New York, like all on my own 
at 28 years old to um, set up and run the company out there. And I, I look back now that I'm, you know, older and 50 and wiser, and I think that's bonkers, you know, 28. But then you look at Mark Zuckerberg and what he did by the time that he was 28, and, and you realize age is a number. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a yardstick by which or how we should measure anyone anymore, which is, I think, fantastic. Um, and so not only did I have this incredible experience of, of, of working for a dot-com startup in the late 90s and, and all of the, um, yeah, the excitement and the dynamism and the energy that came out of that and the huge learning experiences. You know, there I was going in to talk to senior vice presidents of, of uh, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo and Citibank this little, and I've always looked quite young for my age, but like this little English girl, you know, knocking on the door saying, I need to come and talk to you. I mean, goodness me, did that make me grow up and grow resilience and, and bravery. Um, but also, you know, I got to live in New York, age 28, when Sex in the City was like the show on TV. And obviously I'm not that brave. My life was never as sexy and desirable as any of the women on, on that show. But I, you know, I, I drank a lot of cocktails. I bought a lot of pairs of shoes and I had a lot of very nice handbags. And um, I, laid, I made a lot of incredible friends that I'm still great friends with. And, you know, I, 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 look, I look back on that and, and I just think, A, what an amazing opportunity, but B, what, you know, what, what an incredible time of, of my life. And again, that comes back to opportunities are there. Quite often we don't see them. So it's how do we always, because it would have been easy to say, no, I don't want to go to New York. I, I don't want to do that job. I don't feel up to it, which particularly women do. Um, in Cheryl Stanberg's brilliant book, Clean In, um, she talks about a survey that was done that says when men will apply, I might get the number slightly wrong, uh, men will apply for a job when they're only 50% confident they can do it. And women will wait until they're 95% confident that they can do the job before applying for it. I, I yeah. mean... I would have had no clue how to do this job. It was, you literally, you learn the way on the way. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's a, a really incredible. And then the company got bought by Sun Microsystems and then I worked for Sun Microsystems, which, you know, of its day was like, you know, the big, one of the big glamour tech companies of the, of the sort of the, the 90s. Um, so that was an, an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. And you've made me think, um, your, your parents had two daughters, just the two yeah. of you and Karen? Uh, and uh, I had two daughters. I've remarried and I've now got a son and a daughter as well. They're all in their late 20s, 26 to 29. But it's interesting with my two daughters, Harriet and Brani, um, my ex-wife and I brought them up to believe that they could do anything. And they went yes. to a, a girls only school where there was no limits on it. You could just do anything. And they have. You know, they went and got first class honours degrees. I'm very proud of them that one at Bristol, one at Cambridge. And they, they went to parts of the world where people were far less uh, privileged than they are. And they, they helped out and, and worked in different charities there. And, and one's been in teaching and now gone into the digital um, and digital, which is a company which helps people go digital. Uh, the other one uh, went uh, from Cambridge to a law firm and then on to a Cardo group um, and is doing sort of strategy and acquisition. They, they just have great belief in their achievement. And you and your sister are clearly the same. Any thoughts about how you bring up girls to believe in themselves? Oh, I mean, that is a, I think that's a great, and I applaud you for your, for your, um, you know, your ability and, and your success in, in doing that with, with, with your daughters. And I, I, I was the same, you know, my, my dad brought me up. He's very traditional um, and he's very chauvinistic and very sexist towards everyone in the whole wide world, apart from his two daughters and his wife. Um, and when it comes to them, he's the world's biggest feminist. <laughs> Slight double standards. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he brought us up um, to believe that girls can do anything. With the caveat also, which I think is true, that it's harder for girls. Yeah. Um, and we don't like saying that because it shouldn't be true, um, but it is true. And I do believe that had I, because I'm a strong personality, and there are lots of studies that say when women are strong, they're less likable in the workplace. Um, when men are strong, they're viewed as being great leadership potential in the workplace. And, you know, I, I know that particularly when I was younger and a, a little bit less maybe self-aware, um, I was less likable and that maybe held me back. And I do believe that had I been a man, 
I would, I've, and I've been very, very successful, but I do believe that had I been a man uh, with my character, I would have been even more successful than, than I have been. But I, I really believe, I have this little soundbite that I like, that the sky isn't the limit your belief system is. Mm. Um, and that only those who risk going too far can truly find out how far they can go. And this is, comes back to being comfortable with failing, right? If we only ever stay within our comfort zones, we only ever stay within uh, trying something or going for something or even giving ourselves a target that we know we can achieve, we'll, we'll never really truly understand what our, what our potential is and we'll never reach our full potential. And actually the, the, greatest, the greatest detractors to us reaching our true potential, it's not your boss, it's not your, your family, it's, it's you. And it's what, it's what you believe inside. And, and I, again, you know, I was very fortunate, as I, I believe your daughters will have been, to have been given that internal boost of, of self-confidence that maybe some um, young people, not just women, but, you know, young men and women from whether it's different racial backgrounds, sexual orientation, um, different family circumstances. Um, I totally appreciate that, you know, my background was very comfortable and, um, you know, very loving family, very secure but th th this, this is what we've got to crack, I think, in the talent pipeline and in the school system, is that it's not quite if you can believe it, you can do it, because you've got to put the hard work in. It's, it's it, you know, we can't, we can't sugarcoat the pill and just say, I want, and I want to do this, and then suddenly, ta-da, here it comes wrapped in a bow. I think it's really important that we're really transparent about the graft, the long hours, how much work it takes to get there. You get out what you put in. Um, but it, 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 it's, you've got to believe it. Yeah, it's, it's really great wisdom. And you've got a, a wealth of uh, tips to share. And I'm, I'm really picking up a lot as we go along, making little notes here. Um, if you were to go back with the wisdom uh, that you've accumulated from successes and some failures that you've made and the humility that you've gained over the year, I, I, I do, my wife, when she wrote a book, Inspiring Women Leaders, uh, found time and again with about the 200 women that she interviewed for her book, Lee, um, was that, yeah, they, they'd often say that um, there is this bias in the system and that a behaviour that's male, if the same one was exhibited by a female, they'd get a completely different reaction, often negative. Uh, and, and that's been my experience. And also uh, headhunting friends of ours, uh, the female uh, headhunting friends of ours say they get very frustrated because they got the best women for a role the blokes blag it with 50% of the skills. The women have got 95% of them, but they go, ah, I'm not quite ready yet. I, I just, I, I might pull out of this one. And they go, no, no, stay, please. And, and when they do stay, they get it. And, and then we have the imposter yeah, syndrome. Self-sabotage. Yeah. Women are brilliant at self-sabotaging their own careers. Yeah. And again, I, I would encourage any leader out there who's listening to this, who is mentoring young women to really be cognizant of that and to proactively watch out for it. Yes. And also Lee found in the research that sometimes some women said, I actually have found it easier working for a man than I have for another woman because they don't always help pull up the sisterhood. Men help men, but women need to help other women more than they do. Oh, is yeah. my experience. And they sometimes I don't know. We'll just uh, I've seen this with Lee, that certain women just take it just against her for no particular reason or they don't like the look of her compared to there or it makes them feel this or that. And it can be very hard. So it's, it's a whole topic in its own for another day. Perhaps you can discuss that when you're on Lee's podcast. Um, let's go a quick fire round the Inspire Leadership Compass with some of your thoughts and ideas. And before we do that, if you met the 16 year old Sophie, what one bit of advice would you give knowing, knowing all that you've done? Just stay true to yourself. Stay true to yourself. Yeah, that's so good. And this is what it's very interesting. Uh, the late, um, uh, what was he? He was a, one of the top uh, TED talks. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson uh, sadly died a few years ago or a couple of years ago. He was my favorite TED speaker. If you ever want to, to learn skills of a, a good public speaker, Sir Ken, it's that combination of humor, humility, and humanity, which is such a lovely mix, which I, uh, I see you having it and a nice sense of humor too. But um, it's this thing about um, being yourself, and yet when you're quite young, 
if you're in a, he said it because he worked in education, if you went into a class of children aged about seven, eight, who's a good artist here? They'd all put their hands up. I'm a good artist. You know, they'll happily draw. And that lovely one he had with a, a child, and the teacher looks over and she said, she sees this child working on this, this bit of artwork, she said, what are you doing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher went, but nobody knows what God looks like. The little girl said, they will do soon. <laughs> and it's that, it's that, they will do soon. It's that, it's that lovely self-belief. But yet, if you take the same class to when they're 18, who's good yeah. at art? You know, like one person will put their hand up. And the rest of them have been made to doubt themselves and question themselves and not be so sure about who they are. So we do so much damage to that great little self-believing person that thinks they can be a superhero or the president of America or the prime minister of the UK as the first woman or another woman or whatever. And then somehow we crush it all. Um, but uh, sorry, you got me off on another topic. Let's go around the compass. MQ, uh, your morals, your values, your beliefs. What would be two or three of the, the top ones? I think you talked about integrity, kindness and hard work. Would you wanna, is that still resonant for you? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And, and I think I would always add kindness um, because, I mean, for, you know, for, for, for all of obvious reasons that there, there is there is something around values in the in the workplace as well, that any of my old Boots colleagues um, who are listening to this will just roll their eyes and start laughing. So which I, I believe and I'm not sure if it's a value versus a skill. So maybe you can tell me if we should talk about it later instead which is also about being a good critical friend. Um, and it's because it's about how not only do you raise the ceiling, but you also raise the floor. And if, and if we're not honest and kind with each other about the areas that we need to improve in, actually, I think it comes back to integrity. You know, if we just sit there and say, God, Jonathan, this podcast was absolutely amazing. Da, 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 and actually didn't say, and here's one or two ways I think it could be improved for the future, even if that's what we think inside, Am I acting with integrity or am I just telling you what I think you want to hear? Um, and, and again, coming back to, I, I'm a huge believer in teamwork. You know, one of the reasons people say to me, well, you know, why do you still keep working with companies, Sophie? Why don't you just like strike out on your own? And, and I have done consultancy work, but always as part of a team. And it's because I love being part of a team. I really believe in we over me. And, um, and, and in terms of that, that teamwork, I think all of those sort of come together, the, the integrity, um, the kindness, the, the we over me, and being a good critical friend. And I've found they sit with me and my values very strongly. Uh, I, you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve, um, uh, but they, they seem to be a, a, a good combination for me and, and for my life. And I think that's the other thing your own values are your own values you can't sticky plaster on other values you can tell straight away if they're not authentic yeah i i love that one and colin powell in his book said it worked for me i think it was the title of his book and i think of a time when i was with the scots guards based in cyprus and uh they got a fine history going back you know 700 years or something i mean phenomenal um history that they have and um, we had a visit by some American uh, officers and they said, we're gathering traditions and um, rituals that certain regiments have, and we're gonna get, make a big collection of these. And then the, the American regiments can choose which one they want. I went, no, 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 you've missed it completely. <laughs> this happened, like the fact that the officers don't drink milk with their coffee. That's because in the first world war, there was one cow. And so the officers said, we'll do without milk so that the men can have some milk. Uh, like, the, why would that make any sense to another unit? So it's got to be what works for you. But there are some truisms that tend to be timeless between sectors, which is why I so love coaching CEOs, boards, directors and, and uh, individuals like yourself, is that there are some truisms from across all sectors of things that will help you. Uh, yeah. As an American general said to me, he was my mentor when I was in Fort Leavenworth. He said, General Jonathan, he said, I'll tell you where all the mines are planted that I learned about when I was in my military service. He said, you don't need to stand on those. But overnight, little bastards have come out and planted some more. I don't know about those ones. You're yeah. going to have to find those yourself. 
but you don't need to blow your foot off on some of the things that I've blown my foot off. Purpose is the next one, PQ, so MQ to PQ. What gives your life meaning and purpose, your vocation, your calling? Why do you do what you do, Sophie? I, lo I love doing what I do. And I was very fortunate that I ended up working in digital. Um, everybody would have said, oh, it's easy for people to say, oh, we always knew it was going to be enormous. No, we didn't. And I was put on this project called The Internet in 1995 when I was a graduate trainee at Reuters. Um, and it's, it's been very exciting. And I, I was definitely in the right place at the right time. And back to opportunity, I took the opportunity and I seized it. But really what gives me purpose in continuing to work is seeing and developing my team around me, my colleagues, and helping them be the best version of themselves that they can be. And that's important, the best version of themselves, not what I think they should be, but who they want to be and, and what they want to be. And you know, when, when I joined Boots, I think we had maybe 40% vacancies in the boots.com team. It was a team that um, was a little bit maybe unloved, like little mushrooms kept in the dark, sort of in, you know, in the back corner of the office. And there was a real lacking of self-belief and um, hopefully uh, I gave them a, a huge amount of self-belief. And, you know, by the time I left, the turnover of the team was, was minuscule. And, you know, people would stop me in the corridor and say, oh, you know, if there's an opening on boots.com, you know, please can I be considered for it? Right. And, and, and we went from being, you know, the little mushrooms in the dark to being the tall poppies in the field um, that, that everyone wanted to come. And, and I didn't do that on my own. You know, my team did that because I was able to help them be the best versions of themselves. It's like strong alone, but invincible together. Gosh, it is so exciting talking to you, Sophie. Uh, we, we, we're going to have to carry this conversation on shortly after. We haven't got that much time. And so I'm going to do some quick fire with you because each of these are just gems. Health quotient, um, mental, physical health and well-being. What would you give as a tip for, 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 for helped you with good mental health and helped you with good physical health? Uh, mental health, pre-COVID, I live in Chamonix. So I would, my weekends, I switch off, I get out in the mountains, back to the point about, you know, walking. Walking is my meditation. You don't have to meditate, but find out your own version of what meditation does for you. For some people, it's running on a treadmill. Some people, it's swimming in a swimming pool. Some people, it's snuggling with their dog on the sofa. It doesn't matter what it is, but work out what helps you switch off. And then physical health, Again, you know, you, you, you get out what you put in and we're all, you know, I think fe feeding yourself well is the biggest act of self-love that you can give yourself. Um, and, you know, we, we're all educated and we're all smart people, but we, you know, we do continue to put junk in our mouths and down our throats, don't we? And, mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, we just need to be mindful of that. Yeah, very, very Can't true. Can't do that without consequences. No, so so agree. Um, and we were talking about, um, I can hear my tummy grumbling as the end of my intermittent fasting comes up. I'm looking forward to uh, my next stint of eight hours before I have 60, 16 hours of fasting. EQ, um, emotional and social intelligence. What would be a top tip that you found um, to take yourself from being, uh, as it were, still the same person, but perhaps less likable, uh, to, the, to the woman you are now, who's very easy to engage with people, um, what's, what's one of those skills you've learned over time, which is true to you, but really helps you be uh, good at EQ? Self-development. Mm. Do, do the work yourself. Don't wait for a training course or for work to decide to put you on a training course. I'm, maybe I'm fortunate, I'm really intellectually curious. So I've read a lot of books around whether it's, you know, personal development or, um, you know, li living your best life or deep work. So I would say self-development and then, you know, that old chestnut, be open to the feedback. Yeah. I mean, I used to be terrible at taking feedback. I would like inside my tummy would go, but I was doing my best. <laughs> Don't you? I was doing my best. How can you criticize me? I was doing my best. Yeah. And you know what? Even now when I still get feedback, this, it's a little whisper, but I was doing my best. <laughs> That's of course, good. everyone comes to work to do their best. No one ever comes to no. work going, I'm deliberately going to do my worst today. Yeah. Of course we do. But again, it comes back to being the champion of your weaknesses. 
Great. And, and being really confident in going, you know what? I can't be good at everything and I'm cool with that. Yeah, no, I, I love that one. And I, I certainly will always remember raise your ceiling and raise your floor. That's that's stuck with me. And Deep Work by Cal Newport is a great, a great book. And uh, we'll have to chat about favorite books, I suppose, as I say, over the last three years, some 200 books that I've uh, listened to um, on these topics. So we'll swap, we'll swap books, uh, Sophie, after this. CQ. Um, Cultural intelligence, we've, we've replaced IQ with CQ because we think it's much more important. Is it collective mm -hmm. intelligence, cultural intelligence? It's all about diversity, equality, inclusion, how you accept and embrace other people who are different from you. What would be one of your top tips for diversity, equality and inclusion and cultural intelligence? Well, back to what I've already said, that um, talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. It's also um, an economic fact that companies that are more diverse are more successful. And it should end there, right? That, I mean, that, sh that should be the full stop and we shouldn't even need to talk about it anymore, but yet we do. And there still aren't enough women's on boards, let alone people of color um, and other minority groups. I have always been quite passionate about diversity and, and inclusion. Um, I don't know why, it's just something that has just always, ah, back to integrity, it's about fairness, I, I think. Um, and I've just always believed it doesn't matter what color your skin is, who you love, what God you follow, what ability your body or even your mind may or may not have. The whole point is that we are all different. That's the point. Because if everyone was the same, then nothing would change. Yeah, beautifully put. Taking it from that, which I think is so pertinent, the, and, and I do, I've written that down and highlight more diverse companies are more successful, all the research. From, from various companies, tells us time and again, RQ, as you were crawling along in the Himalayas, shouting out, I've got a real, real admiration for you because I know up and down some of those damn hills in Nepal, they seem to go on forever. Adversity, coping with adversity, resilience, um, and bouncing back, this flexibility to bounce back. What would be your top tip on, on resilience, RQ? Well, I'm really glad you used the word resilience because I think a lot of times people go straight to endurance mode and that's where you get burnout and exhaustion um, and, and, and that, you know, chronic fatigue. And, and you know, we don't want anyone to be hanging out in endurance mode. Um, and resilience is a muscle. I think we, again, it's self-work that we all need to build on and, and to develop. And I think resilience for me is I've learned that you can't control outside events but you can control how you react to them. So the situation plus your response equals the outcome. No one can ever make you feel inferior without your consent. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. I think, you know, easy to say, not always easy to do, but we can control how we react to events. And we, we have to accept that there are things will happen to us that are like me being made redundant, completely outside of, of my control. So, so all feelings are valid, but feelings aren't always fact. And you, you've got to be able to separate your feelings from the facts. I think that's, and, that's... Also, and also just remembering that there are so many people in the world that, you know, I could have been a young girl born in Afghanistan. Yeah. No, you know? uh, profound, profound. And, and I also written down that all feelings are valid, but feelings are not fact love that one and and with that with people forget what you say they forget what you do but they never forget how you make them feel which is back to the eq so always remember ask yourself in this meeting i'm going into to lead how do i want them to feel at the end of it mm -hmm. people go, well i just got my point across i told them yeah but how do they feel and i was uh, you've done some big programs in the digital world and in my days in pwc we did a big digital program with one of the big government departments and everything was in place and they'd all spread it all out they forgot the people. They forgot how people would feel, that they didn't want to go with the change. They didn't like the change. No one had sold it to them. No one had engaged them and brought them in. So, so people's hearts, if you get their hearts, their bodies will follow. Brand, you talked about 360 degree. And, and, and I found it's always very interesting. Um, in the last 20 years, the only time I've ever been found, uh, fired from a job, um, just, just with a client, was with one CEO who I tried to persuade for a long time that he needed to do 360. He was living in a parallel universe. 
and actually it would help him if 20 people gave him some feedback and I did some phone interviews. He begrudgingly agreed and that it was going to be chaired with the chairman and the CPO. And then when I produced both and I debriefed him on it, he fired me because I said, you don't, you're firing me. No, 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 I'm not. I just don't need to have any more coaching. I said, no, you just don't like what you're hearing. And I'm not going to be the emperor with his new clothes and say, oh, you look fine. I'm going to say he's got no clothes on. And I did but I got fired. And that's one of the prices that you pay of telling truth to power. And I think people need to have that, that one about truth to power, but I, got, I went off on one, sorry. Brand, what's your top tip on brand, reputation, image, and impact? Well, again, I think, you know, being, being true to yourself, um, because I think that that's incredibly obvious now, whether someone is acting authentically and with integrity versus whether someone's, you know, putting on a show. Um, and, you know, my, my brand has definitely been, and, and, you know, it's really, as I've got older, whether it's wisdom, whether it's just experience has got stronger and stronger. It's about, you know, being true to yourself. So I, I am a champion of, of women who aren't married. I am a champion of women who haven't had children. And um, these are voices that are particularly the child-free women that are quite underrepresented and society has a real stigma against us. So quite often when I tell someone I'm child-free, they either go, oh, that's a shame, or, oh, but aren't you worried about being lonely? And they project what they think about being child-free onto you. Mm. And, you know, I've always found that when people tell you something shouldn't be done, it's a reflection of their limitations, not yours. Oh, so um, true, so true. So I, I think that, you know, my, my personal brand is the color pink, because pink is, it's actually funny I'm not wearing pink, but, uh, you know, quite often my hair is pink. And the reason for that, Jonathan, is because, one of my very first milk round jobs, uh, you know, we're going through the milk round into the after uni, I was at Newcastle Uni, was at Kellogg's. And I had bought this lovely, I always liked pink, don't know why, but I just did. I had this lovely pink suit that I bought from Next. And I, I was interviewed by a very nice man and I got down to like the last kind of two or three people. And they didn't hire me because I wore a pink suit to the interview. And I, yeah, I should have worn like, well, basically I should have dressed like a man, should have worn a navy blue probably a trouser suit I don't know yeah. oh, no. and so uh, and so after that because I'm really like a bit pig-headed when it comes to stuff like that I like I always wear pink and um and my Twitter is Sophie Loves Pink my Instagram is Sophie Loves Pink if you could look around I mean I don't live in a pink plastic house but pink is a strong theme in my life and yeah. if you if, if any was was to play a word association game with me I'm sure lots of words hopefully you Come know back to like, pink strong woman and things like that would come out but I, I absolutely guarantee you every single person would say pink <laughs> well that's brilliant no I love it and legacy LQ the um, final one before we talk a little about uh, executive teams and then your favorite book and then we'll have your top tip so uh, in a word what do you want your legacy to be Sophie I think it's I don't have one word it's that I helped people become the best version of themselves that they could be. And I helped them really realize the opportunity of their true potential. I always say to my total superstars, I know that I've done a good job when I end up working for you. Mm. And I'm pretty sure that will happen with a couple. Yeah. No, uh, then, that, then, then, you know, then my job is done. Yeah. Uh, it's the, I, I always love whether it be in my past jobs in the army and then in business, the alumni of people that worked for me, I've, I loved seeing them go on and do oh, successful yeah. in different ways. That, that's, that's great. But a lot of people hang on to their best talent and won't let them grow or fly yeah, away. Too. And they're, they're, they're playing the smaller game. You should be surrounded by an army of giants, men and women who are metaphorically taller than you in their specialist yeah. areas. And then you'll never work a day in your life and you'll have so much fun, but they don't. They want to be the biggest person and keep push people down. And that's so small minded. Yes. Let's go on to um, uh, taking a team from being toxic to being high performing. If you had occasions when that's happened, what one thing did you do that was particularly powerful in turning around a team from toxic to, to high performing? You've got to identify the moldy fruit in the basket and mm. get rid of them. Yeah. Because it's the same with people as it is with fruit, as I'm sure this analogy isn't new to many people listening. But if you have a fruit bowl and you have lots of fresh fruit in the fruit bowl and you put one piece of moldy fruit in there, then pretty much overnight, the whole fruit bowl will become moldy. 
And I have found in my experience, it's exactly the same with teams. So sometimes, you know, everyone deserves a chance. Obviously, um, you know, again, back to being a critical friend, you need to give the people feedback and give the people the opportunity to change. But I have also found it's very, very apparent when people don't want to change, you know, back to your CEO story. Um, and when that happens, you know, we, ha we have to take the harder decisions and realize that they're probably not happy because they're not performing in their job. You're probably going to do them a favor. Um, but but we're not good at leaning in as much as we should do and having these harder conversations. And we yeah. need to get better at it because it's a lose-lose situation. Correct. Because a fleet is only as fast as its slowest ship. Mm -hmm. you, you're so right. And, and I had a, a case uh, with a, a, a virtual team I'm working with at the moment, uh, or, or, or I have worked with them in the past, rather. And uh, good, good team, but there was one person that just sucks the life out of everybody else uh, and I've had the conversation that that person is not a leader, shouldn't be there. Keep them in their own area, doing their own specialist area. But we call them NANP, not allowed near people. Don't bring that person. If they're of value as a specialist, a technical specialist, have them doing that. But do not have them disenfranchising and disenchanting other people. Um, your book, your favourite book. Yes. How will you measure your life? by Clayton Christensen. So he um, was a Harvard professor. He's now actually passed away, I, I found out. But um, it's the most extraordinary book, as you can probably tell by all of the tabs that I have got in it. So, you know, throughout the book, I like highlight, I make notes. Oh yeah, I always write in a pink pen. I mean, I'm very true yeah, to my, yeah, yeah. my brand. Um, and it's, it's the most extraordinary book. So he was at Harvard um, with um, the likes of Oh, I can't remember his surname now, Ken, who went on to run Enron. Yep. And, and, and you know, he sort of takes um, lessons from great business leaders and, and, you know, sort of talks about the Enron CEO, who obviously ended up being incredibly corrupt. And I, I think he committed suicide in prison um, and saying that, you know, at Harvard, he was he was a great man who only wanted to do great things in the world. And, and how is it that he ended up, you know, committing serious, serious corporate and criminal fraud? Um, and it, it, you know, gosh, I, I, it's, it's on my bedside table because I'm reading it again now, given what's just happened to my sister. Um, but it, it is, it is a really incredible book. And I know we all know this, but when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to spend the time thinking, I wish I'd spent longer in the office, but, but you are going to be thinking about was the time that I had well spent. Yeah. And this book really helps you think about, again, we're all individuals. What's right for you. Yeah, very profound. And, and, and with the death of your sister, I think that's that's even more important. We go back to these very fundamental things and I will listen to that book. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for that, Sophie. So, Sophie, would you introduce yourself once again and give us your two minute top tip? Yeah. Hi, so I am Sophie Neary, a group director for Facebook in the UK and Ireland. I've been working in the digital world since 1995, managed thousands of people um, over my career. And my top tip from you is celebrate your wins, but never be complacent, because there's always something that you can learn about from the next adventure that you embark upon. So even if something goes super well, I always ask myself, how do I do it even better next time? And with that goes hand in hand in terms of it's easy to know what your strengths are, but truly, truly great things happen when we become the champion of our weaknesses. And we need to hunt down friends and colleagues um, who can shore us up where we are weak because no one is good at everything. Sophie, thank you very much. Great wisdom, as I knew there would be. And it's been lovely having you on the series. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan.